Wow. Welcome back. Uh, today I have a TV to a Noonan, uh, or Noon, uh, Noonan, uh, for us, depending on your pronunciation, of course. Uh, and uh, it's 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 two okay it's two two uh, featuring myself and Darson uh, on the axis against area and Volskan allies, and uh, it's a pretty good match and I think it's worth looking at. And one one interesting thing that I can offer to the fact that I'm in this match as well is that after the replay, and and and, uh, and looking at how this match goes, I can actually go into uh, my company and show the build and and unit composition that I used. Uh, for this match and the general idea of, in, of the gameplay uh, that I was trying to go for this company and whether it was successful or not and as well as during the game I can possibly offer some insight into what I was trying to do uh, during the game as well um, we'll see how it goes I don't normally like casting myself because it feels awkward for me uh, but let's see if we can make this work and maybe offer some extra insight on what was happening in the match uh, from the point of view of a player which is not something you can normally get from a replay uh, but first, let's talk about the map itself, Noonan. Uh, Noonan, or Noonan again, pronunciation, is, is a pretty commonly played map. To, to, in fact, it might be the most popular next to maybe, like, say, Bergen or Nouvel itself. And, and there's a good reason for that. It's an extremely well balanced map in that it's able to uh, offer grounds for any kind of playstyle to work on this map, to the differentiation geography, without really making any single playstyle the most successful on the map. That you could see on maps like, say, Road to Tobruk or, or, um, or say, Dawn, right? Uh, where singular kind of place or Bastion, especially Bastion, where singular playstyles have a clear dominance over other kinds of playstyles. And Noon doesn't have that issue. And Lewis, let's take a look at why and what some of the key features of this map are. Uh, first, let's look at key features. Uh, the first one, with anyone who's ever played Noonan or played EAR or Company Heroes in general, you'll see this big effing church in the middle right here. And this church is important for a couple of reasons. Um, one, due to the way the company affairs engine works and the way units and houses work, uh, getting a unit out of a church due to its sheer size is actually really difficult because grenades become less effective uh, against units and the larger, the larger the building gets, the less effective things like grenades get uh, against buildings. Um, the reason for that is due to the way the positioning of units and buildings works, right? Uh, the more space up the units are, the less likely the grenade is to hit multiple targets. So all the support with like an MG in the in the church uh, can be dealt with, with grenades pretty easily because you know you can always have two crew members at the actual support weapon itself. If you have like a squad of infantry and they're like an LMG Marine squad or an LMG 42 Grenadier squad, it's actually really difficult to get them out of the uh, out of the church in any reasonable time if you're trying to make an aggressive push past or around the church. Uh, just the spacing the units have in that church. That's one reason. The second reason is if you have church control, you have a massive sight range uh, that you have that your opponent does not. If you're in the church, your sight range probably extends from about this house here, cutting off across this way, and going across the road and a bit past that, uh, and even to the south as you move around, you're going to be seeing probably past this Pedro down here, all the way around. But the point is, uh, the reason this matters is that if you're trying to make a push uh, from either direction, uh, say you're tr if you're from the south trying to push up the roads or push at the church itself, or if you're trying to church uh, push down uh, through this alleyway from the, the north here, either at the church or around it, uh, the point is uh, your opponent is going to see what you're doing uh, before you have a chance to see what they might be doing to re react to you. What I mean by that is, uh, is basically, if you're pushing from the north, let's say, uh, by the time you have uh, the, your opponent is going to be seeing you, by the time you reach around here, right, they're going to already see you coming at them. You're not going to see what they're holding back here until you get awfully close, right? So you're not really sure what you're running into, and this makes defending that uh, around the church very easy from either direction, right? So that's the church, and and everybody knows about the church probably. I'm uh, going to move around to the, the actual sectoring in the, in the flanks uh, of this map. And you notice one particular thing uh, that that is interesting here. Uh, you can see the clear delineation of where the midline of this map kind of is, right? It's kind of this section here. This is kind of your midline, right? And the way you see, and, and because of that midline, uh, you can see the sectoring pretty works out pretty well, right? Here's a sector here. Oh, my bad. Let me re redraw that. Uh, here's a sector here around the midline, and you can see the sector's kind of cut off at this kind of midline point. Uh, this church doesn't really, but um, again, you can see these kind of sectors cutting off here. Pretty standard, except 
you run into one thing right right away, which you'll notice in the sector is the sector across the church road is actually really large and it kind of intrudes upon uh, both sides uh, of the map, uh, depending on if you, if, you, if you have control of it, right? So that means if if you're able to gain control of this sector, right, you're you're kind of you're kind of intruding upon and making it kind of difficult for the opposing side to gain that sector back to the way there's a really long connection here. So that's something to keep in mind when you play this map as well. If you can control this sector, you can, can kind of put an inordinate amount of pressure psychologically on your opponent, right? So let's say the south side uh, controls this. Uh, again, we're going to say this is south and uh, this is north for the sake of our orientation. Um, so let's say the south side controls the sector here. Well, the thing is the north side is going to assume when you when you see the sector under your opponent's control, right? You're going to assume they have some kind of presence in here, whether that's true or not. And usually it's not true because even though you, chances are you've just got someone sitting over here controlling the sector rather than someone sitting over here controlling the sector, right? What that means is that it makes, psychologically, it makes it very difficult for that other, the, the, the north side to want to push into, say, uh, this area here uh, because it, they assume someone's got control of the sector, right? And they assume the opponent is in the sector because they've got control. So it means if we need control the central sector here, it generally translates into having control of these sectors as well right here. Um, so that's something to keep in note when you're fighting this field over here. Otherwise, though, this field is generally speaking where our major armored pushes do happen around this field. Another quirky thing you'll know about, notice about the field, though, is, and, and people realize this pretty quickly, is that uh, there is a kind of no man's land in the middle here, uh, declared by this house hut and this little hedge here. Generally speaking, this hedge will go down pretty fast at some point. And this, this hedge is here, right here as well, go down really fast as well, at one point. And once these two hedges go down, the gameplay in this field really changes because suddenly the field goes from kind of insular here to this fencing here that you know infantry can't really get around, and to these hedges, kind of giving some line of sight blocks you can play around with. Once these are gone, um, uh, basically the play happens around this hedge, this unbreakable hedge line here, this unbreakable tree here, and this tree back here. And again, why this is important is that once you have control of the cent long central sector here is, and these hedges go down, it's really hard to really take back unless you make major concerted push around this this line with armor or maybe some major infantry push, but it's really hard to make those infantry pushes because a couple MGs can really shut down uh, this entire open flank here, right? Unless you can get like into this house and maybe get some smoke cover going, right? And it's also really interesting to see early uh, right, uh, area infantry engagements around here. Or early game infantry engagements on here because of this fencing here. Uh, because of this fencing, you, you, when you're making infantry pushes, you're really only going to be able to move through here or have to go all the way around through here. So it is actually kind of limiting. So even though this in the early game, uh, this is actually a really wide sector, right? Uh, basically, the push is only going to be happening through here or through this area here, right? Uh, because of this fencing, which is why this is if you have some early game vehicles. Uh, this area is much more valuable to play in because then you can crush all these fences and let your infantry kind of move more freely. Although it does make support weapon gameplay really interesting in the early game here as well because an MG can really cover its own flanks because uh, if you set it up, you know where the opposition has to come for you uh, when you're coming through here. So let's say you're playing north, you can put an MG in the house here or an MG just around here and you can just cover this zone and then maybe put like a mine over here to cover the flank, right? And same alternative uh, when you're when you're attacking the south, uh, let's say, uh, you can pour an MG basically like right here. And you don't have to worry about shit on this. You don't really have to worry about anything here because if they're going to come to you, they're going to come to you direct from the, at the fence, but they can't get to you, so you can just kind of run away. Or they have to come and flank all the way around. And again, that just it gives your MG so much time to move uh, if there's no vehicle play here because these fences really limit infantry movement in this sector in the early game. And then, uh, so again, uh, so that's your field here. Basically, it's, it, it doesn't open up until vehicles start coming on the field, right? Um, and this side over here, we have a little bit of urban. And I, I, and I always enjoy urban sections of maps because they, they allow people who have really good infantry micro to really show off that micro, right? And that, and that tends to happen at, uh, environments like this, urban environments in, in company heroes. Uh, again, same things. There's a couple of alleyways you'll notice of attack here. And again, you'll notice that hedges play a really important role here, in that uh, moving down, uh, moving down these sectors gets really hard once a couple of hedges go down. In particular, oops, one second. Uh, in particular, when this hedge goes down and this hedge goes down, 
uh, armor pushers in this section of map really basically die out because if you have an ATG like sitting around here and this hedge is down here, like this hedge is gone, this hedge is gone, or this hedge is gone, moving down these roads for vehicles is really rough because ATGs can have full on coverage of these roads, right? Just just kill off any vehicular movement in the sector without really having much flanking ability in here for a vehicle, a tank or vehicle. Um, so this is really an infantry heavy sector for the map, relegated with, with maybe some AT support from vehicles, but not really any infantry support from vehicles due to how easily vehicles can be killed here. Not only by ATGs, but due to the way these houses are placed here, and these hedges are placed here. Even things like sticky bombs or magnetic AT nades uh, or mines are really effective at shutting down vehicle pushes here. Right, uh, and support weapons again don't work that well either because you have so many little flanking options in this section of the map. So you can't really. This is a really heavy infantry kind of centric area of the map, right? So infantry play can really excel and exceed in this area of the map, uh, versus uh, versus the other side of the map being mostly uh, this side being mostly being vehicular and support weapon play. This is a very core infantry and maybe maybe light vehicle kind of area over here. So that's the basics of the map. Um, really well balanced map. Again, the church is a, 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 can be a bit of a backbreaker uh, in a really close game. Uh, but again, uh, you can still deal with this. Like this isn't the only map with the church on it, right? There's ways to deal with it, and and you can go both ways. Um, the only thing is if you're running a smart team, uh, uh, a smart team that knows they have a compositional advantage, they can really hunker down the side of the map that they know they have a hunk compositional advantage on. And just focus their efforts on the other side. But again, that's that's teamwork and individual skill going into that. So that's not an issue. So, anyways, point is Newton is a great map. There's no real advantage to be had by playing one side or another. If I were to ever say there was something that annoys me about this map, uh, it's this big pool of water here. There's absolutely no thing, there's nothing this pool of water does. I don't mind water on mass maps, and I don't mind like uh, like cities or like really hard terrain on maps. But what I do mind is when they only affect one team versus the other, right? So if this pool of water was, say, in the middle, I would probably be less against it, uh, probably. Because it's on one side of the map versus the other, it does make uh, uh, it does make some sectoral control and some attacking and positioning things a bit more difficult to play. What I mean by that is, um, let's say you're at the south side attacking in the north. If you're able to gain control of, say, uh, this section of the map right here, I'm this map analysis is going a bit long, I'm sorry guys, but uh, I'm just... Saying it. Let's say you're in the south side and you're attacking and you gain control over here. It's really hard for the north side to attack into you because they only really have one uh, or one flanking option, which is this over here. Otherwise, they have to come straight at you to this pool of water here, preventing any push coming along this side, right? So that 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 that's really annoying. Versus, say, if you're if you're if you if they like, let's say the north side has pushed you uh, um, down to say over here, over here, right? Hold on, over here or over here. Uh, as the south side, you still have plenty of flanking options and directions you can come from, right? You can still come from around this side, you can still come from here, and of course the straight around the general flank. Uh, that's, that option isn't available to the north side if the if the south side gets positional control around this kind of chateau over here, due to this <laughs> giant pool of water and, and tree line here, basically. So that's the only possible bad thing you can set this map. Uh, otherwise, good map. So let's start the game now. I've been running way too long on this map now, so let's actually start this fucking game. So, uh, it's our plus, of course, as always, and we're going to start with myself playing uh, as Luftwaffe. We've got two uh, Shrek Falschmagers, a Falschmager sniper, and two Light AD, light AD half tracks. And from recollection, I'm pretty sure one of these is Shrek and one of these is just vanilla. Uh, on the allies, we have Area coming out. Uh, he's running a Bazooka Ranger, a six man flamer captain. An MG, a four-man MG, it looks like. No, that's a th no, yeah, that's a four-man MG, and a four-man ATG. So he's running locked and load, clearly, and uh, he's of course jeeping it out, which is quite nice. I feel like a sleeper unit that people haven't really caught on to yet are these six-man flame engineers. Uh, they're basically rifleman squads with a flamer, and I feel like people really haven't realized the potential that these units have because it's a really tanky amount of health pool. For a flamer to have, on top of say, a company that has reinforcements and profuse smoke and cooldown bonuses uh, via their captains, cover bonuses, or off map smoke, or mortar smoke, or smoke grenades, uh, these six man flamer units are something that are really powerful 
not just situationally, but almost in all environments. They're really powerful, and they have lots of utility, as you can see, with this mine coming down. They can also get demos, they can also get satchels. This is an extremely American combat unit. It's, it's cheap, it's, it's pretty efficient, uh, and it has lots and lots of available utility to it. And I feel like people don't use these as much as they should. Anyway, moving in, you can see Aria's wonderful scouting play, as is known by anyone who plays with Aria. He has some of the best scouting play in all of EIR. He's using this jeep to full advantage, and he's probably got full knowledge of what's being brought on. He's seen these light AD half tracks, he's seen the short guns, he's already seen the sniper. So he knows what he's running against. So let's see how things are played out. So we have uh, myself trying to go for a wide flank here, and again, you see that the, these fences kind of make things tough, so I really should be using these light AD half tracks to break these fences down and trying to make a bit more avenue of approach for myself. Um, and, okay, I've got the LMG-34 on field as well. So I'm trying to make a wide push here, because I myself suppose, since it's area, I know there's probably an MG around here, and I want to do everything possible to avoid this MG. Also now that I found this uh, AT gun, so I've got one half-track really low in health. And I've realized right away, uh, this early game is going to be something I have to use my sniper for pretty profusely, because now I see these bazookas here as well. So my light AT half-tracks aren't going to be doing too much against an ATG plus a, 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 a bazooka ranger squad. And I'm already supposing that since this area, there's an MG squad around here somewhere. And of course, it is in, it is in the church. And let me once again show us what happens when you have spawn in the church. Look at this absurd sight range the church gives you, right, out of the church. But once he's in the church, you saw that what their sight range was like. So having church control is really nice on this map because it lets you really see what's happening. Anyways, I'm making a wide flank around, and I'm trying to scout out and find something. I don't want to engage right away in a full-blown engagement because I feel like the ATG uh, is going to make my light 80 half to really not that viable right now. Uh, so I'm really just trying to pick off units with my sniper here. And Area himself is trying to back off it because while he has a good composition to prevent me pushing into him, uh, he himself, uh, without those flamers finding some uh, combat, aren't isn't doing gonna push me too well either. Because I don't know, he's probably seen my MG, so he knows the MG's there. So unless he can get a smoke and flamer run, run in, uh, he's not gonna be able to do too much. Uh, so that that's a question. He probably shouldn't be building these tank troops here. They're not gonna help him in the early engagement too much. But at the same time, he's holding me off, right? So there's no really definitive engagement happening here. Sorry about that. And that means is, even though he doesn't have exceptional field control, he's still uh, keeping things in the game for his teammate to come on. And his teammate is almost on right now. I get a nice snipe onto his MG. And what, what you'll notice, though, is I've got the MG in church position now, right? So that's really a big deal, especially if this hedge ends going down some point later in the game. Or even right now, although I don't have any heavy pressure build right now. Uh, here's something I do want to point out. You'll notice that the format mark I'm starting to make a push, like a major push right here. This is a mistake, and this is something you'll notice I'll do in games that I play, if you've played with me, is that I will say timers to my teammate uh, for when I'm coming on or when someone's supposed to come on. I'll say 10 seconds till second, 10 seconds till third, or 4 coming up, or 8 coming up. And the reason I do this is because it's really imperative. Look at here, I'm making a major push at the 4 minute 30 second mark, which means I'm going to run to the second allied player before the axe player is going to catch up to me. Um, and this is probably because I'm not keeping track of the clock, and sometimes players do lose track of the clock when they play this game. So if you're in a teammate, if you're a teammate in R+, it's really, really imperative, uh, or it's really good habit to have, remind your teammate of the clock, right? Remind them what the clock is, because there's always a chance that they're not keeping attention to the clock here. So I lose both AP half tracks here, trying to keep the basically just keep the sniper alive in this situation, because I I realize I'm gonna get just run over by infantry. And I had a bad time on that, bad time on that push. But fortunately here, we do have this church MG here, which will probably slow us down here. You notice here the, the rifleman throw a grenade with a really muted animation. This is an upgrade I recently learned about that is available for US infantry. And it's it's actually a really absurdly powerful upgrade. Uh, because it the, it reduces your chances of dodging nade the way the animation changes. And you'll see here some drop microbiome on the self letting a strike squad game satchel charge. Uh, which is a, it was pretty bad, right? I do pick the shark back up though, so it's not so bad. But you'll see a second challenge coming down, and this time I'm aware of it. I do avoid the satchel. And these riflemen are, are getting eaten up by these, uh, I guess the officer squad here, and this G43 uh, KCH. So, again, see, having this church control here, even though I got swamped early on, it let me hold on long enough for my teammate to come in and help me out here. So this, having the central church control is really nice in this map. Uh, you see a, a infant half track with assault guns coming in here, and again, you, it came on really fast. So it had a, it, it avoided damage from that first uh, uh, first bazooka. Um, 
yeah. So anyway, so it's moving in, it's doing its job. Uh, I'm kind of used to... Oh, okay, let me, maybe I missed that. But anyway, so this engagement coming on. This looks like a pretty good access game here. This MG is going to basically suppress everything. So ideally, this imagery half-track should be trying to get rid of this MG, but let's see what's going on. There's this... Ooh, there's this upgun Sherman here. Could go for the sniper. The Shrek's going to turn around, maybe shoot at me? No, they get suppressed, and... Oh, they get killed off. And this... This, this half track decides it's had enough here, it's not going to deal with this German too well, so it's going to try and get out probably. A Satchel coming out of this KCH squad and... Oh, it doesn't actually kill more than one model. Okay, that's interesting. So some heroic crits really helping out here with the health crits. Although the officer squad is pretty low now. Is that even an officer in there? Uh, no, it's just a bodyguard. So this officer squad can probably treat this point. The MG does get taken down, but it gets taken down a little bit late here. Because this push from the Axis has kind of died down already. This MG is... Uh, still alive over here, so there's really no major push, although if this Sherman can go down, it's probably a good trade overall for the Axis. And the Sherman is probably going to go down, it's packed like it's in range. It's bouncing, but the Sherman's not moving, so it looks like the Sherman's going to go down. And again, we have, so you notice here, because of this house control here, uh, although there's no strict control right now, uh, there's no push happening on this side, and the push is happening on this side mostly. Uh, some scouting play, and this MG coming... One, one thing you notice is how quickly this MG suppresses. Uh, another thing that I don't think people realize is how powerful MGs are in the US Infantry Doctrine, right? They've got 40, and apparently they can damage half tracks as well. I'm not sure that makes sense, probably. Um, so the sniper trying to come in, try and snipe out this MG, and hopefully free up these assault friends. And a second IHD coming down the road, probably trying to deal with this MG. All this can run to some riflemen and another MG over here. Uh, but again, again, getting back to infantry company MGs is... I don't think people understand how powerful these units can be. Uh, due to the 45 range they have, they have they have equivalent, really good long reach on the field, right? And with the infantry company doctrine, they'll, they'll get, I think, like, like 25 or 30 percent suppression bonus, which means their suppression rate is the same as MG42, right? It's an allied MG42, but the important thing here is... Ooh, uh, this half track's probably gonna go down. What long does it end in it? Without doing too much, need these MGs. Went down, which is the power of the four-man support weapon crews. Like, it's really hard to get these MGs to go down. This one man, you kill three men here, but the MGs are ready to go. Um, anyways, back to the MGs. It's basically, you have a 45 range uh, MG42 for the allies, but the thing is, it keeps the, the allied MG DPS, right? In terms of its killing potential, so while the, the killing potential of MG42 is, is not really there, it's all about suppression. Uh, the US Infantry Company MG gets MG42 levels of suppression, but still keeps the inherent killing power. So it's not unusual to see uh, US MGs that rack up, you know, 10 kills, right? Because they keep that DPS along with suppression values. So anyways, the Axis are regrouping, and the Allies now are making a good push, for Volskane are making a good push into the town here with his infantry, which is what you want to do. When you're, when you're playing infantry heavy companies, you want to be pushing down this town here, because it's easier to avoid the real town as infantry have. Right? Especially if you have highly vetted infantry like Vet 3 Rangers, I mean, Vet 3 Marines and Vet 5 Riflemen, right? Uh, you're, you're going to be winning most of your infantry and infantry engagements, the only thing that's going to really hurt you is tanks or support weapons. Which again, in this kind of town here where there's lots of little shop blockers and avenues approach, it's really hard for support weapons and tanks to really get at you, so it has to be infantry that gets at you, which is why you want to play your infantry in this section of the town. That's the respond in the town, they're sending infantry of their own, they're sending an assault friend getting stuck in a uh, barbed wire here, but the sniper, two grands and a KCH squad is going to be able to probably push these units off field. Another thing to point out though, if you're playing infantry company and you see high vet infantry, it is imperative you push everything to get that unit off the field. If high vet infantry stays on the field for US infantry company, you're going to regret it because they have reinforcements. Reinforcements on its own is not actually that great a dragon selection. It equates to maybe two rifle squads, right? It's like here have two extra rifle squads for free basically, right? That's not a big deal. Two extra rifle squads not a big deal. But what it does do is if you have a high vet unit or a highly upgraded unit, it lets that particular unit stay on the field longer, right? So if it's a rifle squad getting reinforced, not a big deal. But if it's a vet five rifle squad bars getting reinforced, that's a big deal because you, you have to realize doctrines. I'm not doctrine. Veterancy is super powerful in that veterans doctrines are usually conditional in the bonuses they give, right? If you want a 20% accuracy bonus from a doctrine, it usually says you have to be in cover, you have to be in the house, right? If you want a damage bonus from a doctrine, it usually says you have to be standing still, you have to be in lockdown, right? Veterancy gives unconditional damage and accuracy in the uh, you know survival bonuses. There's no conditional condition to the bonus that veterancy gives you, right? 
So, if you're able to reinforce in highly vetted spots, like vet 5 spots, that's a big deal because that veterancy is unconditional and it lets you stay on field far longer than you normally would, right? So that's why when you're playing Houston 3 Company, it's imperative if you see highly vetted squads or highly upgraded squads like full package squads, get them off the field. It is worth trading a few extra bodies to get those units to retreat or get wiped out because if they get reinforced, they're going to come back at near full health with the same upgrade and still do a lot of damage to you. And so it's worth it. It's worth it. If you're trading units to get these high death squads off the field, it's worth it. You should always do it against US Infantry. Airborne, not so much. Armor, not so much. US Infantry, every time you should really hunt down high vet squads or highly upgrade squads. Because if you don't, you will lose the game. Anyway, back to the game. You've been seeing what's going going on. Just a bit of Sherman play, some martyr play. But that's trying to regroup in the push here. And importantly, uh, while that counter push against the rifleman was happening in the town, uh, area and Volskinator himself have been doing their work here and really barbing up and taking over this left sector, left side of the map right here. And they've had this large sector in the center that we talked about in the beginning, they have control of that right now. So it's going to be really difficult for Axis to gain back control of this middle sector here. Let's see what they're trying to work out. Uh, got a Shrek fall. Uh, oh, a Vanilla fall picked up this MG trying to get back in this house here and try and just keep control here. So an MG is going to be here trying to just give some advance warning if there's infantry push coming on this side again. Uh, we do see these off map ready men. I'm gonna assume there's nothing on them. But this far up the film, I'm gonna assume they're just here for scouting purposes. I know people have been complaining about these off map ready men, and uh, some people don't understand why this complaint is here that you have these free scouting units. They're pretty easy to kill. Uh, they don't have really any major combat condition. They do die pretty easily, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so like complaints about like oh they picked up an LMG or a Shrek it, it's it's not that big a deal honestly there are better things to pick those things up as it's not like these are like really tanky dudes they can take sniper shots but like a vanilla rifle squad or a vanilla grin squad will kill them real fast but what is important here is if you're gonna look to the allies point of view here for three pop and zero manpower cost this entire sec this entire left side of the map is scattered out you can see literally everything the axes are doing on this side. For zero resource investment, you have this sight advantage on your opponent. This is the major issue of having three of these guys, or even two of these guys. Let's let's say you have this church here, uh, this this house here, and this house, and you don't even have the windmill house back here. Again, these bikes kill these pretty fast, right? So they do die fast, but it means that you, for a good portion of time, you have complete intelligence advantage over your opponent for zero resource investment. Which is why a lot of people are pushing for these units to be put down to one, or if possible, none because of this advantage that you can get for, from kind of gaming the system because these are clear uh, Volscan has got ready men with no upgrades on them he's using them purely for the free scouting they offer uh, which is not the original intent of the unit right the intent, the intent of the unit was to be an off map officer but due to the limitations of the uh, the launcher system here uh, the Sherman here ranking up some pr uh, putting some pressure on the axis here in the middle and uh, anyways the original purpose of the ready men was not to be scouting it's to be off map units right but people, you know, the, the, the ability to use these in that section is there, so people do use them, and you know, you expect people to use it. You know, the idea is to gain advantage and use units in every way you can see fit. So even though there's no offense on there, they still provide excellent, excellent scouting uh, for the allies here. The assault guns here are running into a couple of mines, put down the area, and there's a vet three league on field as well. So that's gonna probably help free up the support weapon block that area is being trying to set up with his mortars and MGs here. Uh, all the more just take out the pack here. If this pack is down, if there's communication from the allies, uh, this pack going down means the Sherman could probably make a pretty aggressive push down this left center side. Uh, again, pretty lulled here. Uh, Axe trying to cap back some of the town. And they're, they're, they don't have really good field control. The allies have really nice field control out due to combination of territory and this excellent, uh, not excellent per se, but profuse use of the MGs right now. Uh, the Sherman's going into the town. This probably isn't the best decision, uh, but it's going to run into a Martyr, and both of these, uh, these, uh, Washington die really fast, uh, to these, uh, the Sherman and, uh, Assault Engineers. Uh, Sherman takes a couple of shots from the Martyr, and it probably die. The Satchel takes it after only fire, so both means go down. The Sniper gets away pretty safely. The Sniper's on 23 kills, so quietly that Sniper's been doing a lot of work. The League has, uh, the push, the push in the League has allowed the Axis to gain back control of the central position here. So again, the, the, this, con this, this uh, sector has switched sides and it's probably not going to switch for a little while. Uh, there is a howitzer on field though from area, so he really wants to sneak that. Oh, that's a vet 3 leak down to a howitzer shot. 
a uh, nice shot here by the howitzer. Done already. I'd say it's already done fantastic work. You know, a, a, a vet three league is a lot of damage, and leaks himself with like 380 manpower, 120 munitions, and that's just wiped off the field. 120 munitions. So excellent first watch with the uh, howitzer. And without that league support here, this this the, this infantry supplement is going to be pretty weak against this highly vetted uh, infantry coming from Volskander. Uh, these bikes still trying to kill us off, and also back here failing to do so. And Axe is trying to figure out what they want to do right now on the field. I've got a lot of, uh, myself, I've got a lot of the silk rings on field right now. And um, I don't know if that's full pop, it's not, obviously. Yeah, 22 out of 36, although there's something coming on right now. I'm not sure where it is. Uh, and I'm requesting the bikes being the Scatter because they're this radio man's still alive over here, and they're, you know, we could be doing better things with these bikes. <laughs> uh, so there's a bit of a lull here. We have we have two Hodgkisses coming on field, so uh, up and Hodgkisses, I believe. Yeah, up and Hod Hodgkisses coming on field. Probably counted these Shermans, right? Uh, up and Hodgkisses were nerfed recently, but they're still in pairs. They're still decent salt, uh, anti uh, anti armor, even when the armor is not like say a Persian or a Churchill. Uh, a Sherman will still probably lose to them, uh, although uh, he'll probably do a lot more damage in return uh, before those Hodgkisses do get killed off. So the Sherman here, Sherman Croc from area trying to push in here, but these Hodgkins show up right away. And I, here, here's why you can see it's, it's not crazy. Uh, they're, they're, they're deep, their damage output is pretty low, right? Uh, four shots in the, the Sherman's not quite at half health yet, but it's taking decent damage. There you go, it's at half health after shift, it's a shot. But the Hodgkins making this push here does show off that they're in which allows the Axis to respond probably in advance of what they normally would be able to. And so there's a major push coming here from Axis. Axis is trying to really gain build control back here. We've got three assault guns and the Falschmaker sniper. We see Darson coming in slowly with the Shrek Grenz and one man KC8 spawn. That's a that's a brave man right there. Uh, trying to come in and really make a push here to try and get the allies off the field here. The Shrek's in negative cover. Probably needs to move off uh, before it gets suppressed by this MG or maybe hit by this MG on the clock. Although it's MG here it goes first. And again, you can see the absurd amount of damage these MGs can put, these allied MGs can put out, right? That squad loses a man and is down to half of them just one burst. This clock is probably going to go down to these two Hotchkiss because there's no real AT presence from the allies on field right now. Like, yeah, there's no AT over here. Uh, so that's a major uh, mistake with the allies. They had no AT presence right now. Um, and now they're going to probably suffer for it as the sniper's going to start taking off bodies on this triage. Uh, you'll notice though, again, uh, around this triage, you'll probably see, I don't know if it's going to be done. But because of the stretch here, these squads here can reinforce. So keep an eye on that if this squad gains a man here, this marine or this. Uh... Yeah, see, you can see this veteran marine squad gaining a man back right here. So that's why you should really wipe these uh, units off field if possible. Because they can just keep reinforcing and coming back and doing damage. And keeping their veterans in bonuses. The howitzer tries to snipe the sniper out, but it does, um, yeah, snipe the sniper out, but it doesn't do it. The sniper continues to. Uh push around here. You can see me ask for help here because I've made a major push here and uh, probably at the wrong time. I didn't see the situation my uh, my ally was in. So I, I, I thought I could make a push and get support but my ally wasn't in a position to put support in. So that's a mistake for myself. But the sniper is still taking away model counts. He's up to 30 kills and he's still trying to keep these units uh, from you know reinforcing but it's, it's, it's a losing game. right? The units are going to reinforce faster than the sniper and kill them. So all these units, even though they're losing bodies to the sniper, they can just reinforce afterwards and no, no difference will be made unless we can get one of these squads to trick off them. Which probably isn't going to happen right now if they're actually around to Oh, and the sniper goes down to a mine! I believe the mine is pulled from area due the engineers he's out of the room. And oh, a couple more mines doing damage here. This Hotchkiss goes down, this other Hotchkiss hits a mine. And now there's going to be a major counter push from the allies from that failed push by the Axis. Not a failed push, but the push did a lot. It got a lot of units off the field. It killed the church, I mean not church park, the Sherman Park. But in the end, it didn't get these vetted off the field. And because these vetted infantry are not off the field, they're going to come back later with a... Ooh, this KCH though could do a lot of damage to them. A couple nades going down and... Oh, that's interesting. That was a lot of damage from those nades there, actually. That Probably the vet bonuses. Again, these vet bonuses are big. Although, I would say, it, it may, you just lost the KCH. What, 380 manpower, 120 munitions uh, for maybe a couple kills. Maybe, like a couple of marines, a couple of marines. Uh, that bet five rifle, but I say because of what I said earlier, it was worth it. Trading a KC8 squad for a vet five rifle squad and Tommy is worth it. That rifle squad, if it's not fulfilled, that vet five squad gets reinforced, it comes back and fights off your KCH again later on after KCH is taking damage. Already. So, even though it feels bad losing a KCH squad for a rifle squad against Infantry Company, if it's a vet five rifle squad, trading a KCH squad for a vet five rifle squad is good play, it's good gameplay. It feels bad, but it's good gameplay because you. 
you made sure though that veterans don't see this off the field and not returning. I keep saying this, but it is massively important that people, practice players, understand how important it is against US infantry companies. Get rid of them. Get it off the field. You have to. Right? So again, so uh, we have a lot of Hodgemakers coming in here. So clearly at this point, I'm trying to run low and upgrade these here, which are these assault friends. These probably might my last assault friends we call them the field. And Arya just, he keeps calling these MGs on. He's got, I don't know how many of these he's got in his company. It's clearly a lot. Um, so yeah, his company seems to be purely MGs and, and Crocs, some ATGs and and and, MG, uh, and engineers. And it's, it's not a bad company build. And, it, and as I said earlier, I feel like people are missing out on it. Uh, Shrekgren coming here, trying to scout out probably. And, and Axis have regained excellent field position here actually. Although they don't have church control. And this church control is coming in. And because, see, again, the church goes in, this MG opens up, these uh, rifles open up and do a lot of damage to this Grand Tier squad right here. So, again, that church control once again shows off how powerful it can be. Uh, this MG has insta suppressed this False Shimmer squad and now they the house, and there's really nothing that's going to happen here. These, 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 these falls probably should retreat because MP44s are absolutely useless against the house, right? Uh, the Axe Smart on field now, doing some work, getting these MGs off the field, maybe. Yeah, MG dead, so that's excellent, and a push could probably be made here with combination of these and falls uh, on, on the secretary when the MG is dead, although it's the second MG anyways here, so maybe not so much. Uh, although the Axes are pretty hesitant to make a push here, probably fearing, as I've said, the MG presence that's been shown to in this open field here. It's just really hard to flank around an MG in this open field unless you've got vehicles or uh, a massive infantry advantage. Um, but another problem is making a push on this field here, even if you do get a push on, Placement of this triage means uh, the Axis cannot make infantry fights past here because the rate of triage shield is really, really high. Fighting around a triage, unless you've got artillery or nebel you know, or nebel for supporting you, it's never going to work out because they're just going to heal tank all of the damage you do to them. So Axis, again, kind of not seem, seemingly not sure what they really want to do here. They don't really want to make a push here, so clearly they should be making a push in the town, but they haven't really moved towards that. We have to see the assault trains moving to the town. Yeah, okay, so it seems at this point, Axis have decided, okay, we're gonna, we can't really push the field, we're gonna start pushing the town, let's go. And they're, they seem to be make, making push, they seem to be pushing towards that, but at the same time, right as that push is happening, you see Volsken is starting to make a push in the center here, although this panther seems to have scared them off, so that's probably good for them. And here, here begins the push on the right side, and it's a really large blob here, so there's a good chance they're gonna, yeah, it's a satchel in fact. Oh no, they don't even dodge the satchel! Oh, two assault, four assault guns go down, all of this engineer squad is probably going to go down as well. Um, and then, this engineer squad probably won't be able to deal with it. You did see for a second as the engineers went back up to command, they wouldn't have to use first aid kits. So again, the veterancy with retention potential of USMQ is really, really high. So it's important to get units off field so they don't get to get this veterancy retention machine going. Uh, so this is a really large infantry push, and again, the Axis should do everything possible to focus this infantry blob here down and get it off the field, right? Get this manpower upgrade, vet 3, vet 2 squads off the field, and really just throw away units if they have to, because if these squads reinforce, you're gonna lose the game regardless, right? And, uh, at least on nutrition, unless you're going for a map-based uh, game, then it's a different story. So again, so the Axis are focusing on these KCH coming in, these two Flash Mega squads coming in, this Panther coming in, although he's getting AP rounded, that's kind of hurt. Two Flash Mega squads land back here, so they're really focusing on trying to get these squads off the field if possible, because they are isolated right now. And since they are isolated, and yet they're retreated, so that's a win for the Axis right away. They've lost bodies to do it, but again, these five infantry squads off the field is well worth it. Uh, there's a push coming in from engineers on this side, along with an ATG, and no more AP rounds getting fit into this Panther. The Panther's really been eating damage. Uh, from area so far, and there goes the panther, and we've got vet 3 engineers as well in the in the church, that's really tough. But we have this large flanking push coming around here from the Axis as well, and we see more Flash Makers landing right in the middle of this MG here, but with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, probably 6 squads of Flash Makers in this KCH squad, this MG probably isn't going to be able to handle all of it by itself, and because those infantry from Volsonator were retreated already, area's not going to have any support here because is going to be on Colin timers, and this MG is going to go down probably a combination of this rifle fire. And these Watchmen is coming from the back as well, and Volsonator is just now calling on an infantry presence. He's got two Vet 2 bars and two Marines coming on. And again, uh, so these units, and this Hodgkin is doing a good job, even though it can't really kill it, so you can block these units from getting back in MG, although it eats a uh, AT shot in the transport. 
Um, and looks like the Axes have made a really excellent push here. Uh, first they, they in, and, and it was a detailed push as well. First they isolated and killed Volsnader, and now they're isolating and killing Area. And now with Area kind of being off the field, now Volsnader is coming back and he's isolated as well. Area needs to call units on now, but he's going to be on phone cameras. Now I, uh, Volsnader is fighting this fight uh, on his own basically. And a couple of his, his guards entry really blobbed up, as did Axis. But with the mortar fire here and these flush makers putting down the long range DPS, uh, this this fight's probably not a good fight for uh, for uh, Volskinator, as he kick, 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 takes a couple of mortar shots as well, really hurting his infantry. And again, these units are going to get pushed off before they get a chance to reinforce, which is really bad. So this is actually a really bad engagement for Volskinator. This is an engagement he should have elected to not take, right? This is not an engagement he's taking. He's killed a lot of Volskinators, uh, but he he has lost his veteran scene. That veteran scene needs to stay on field. That's the true power of U.S. infantry, especially if you have reinforcements. Which he does, as we saw from him, reinforcing his main squad back there. Is you get to keep the veteran scene on field. And But he's not keeping his veteran scene on field. He's going into these peaceful engagements. Um, although Area is here now, so he does have some help. Just with his ATG. So this is this this is a better engagement now. If, but think of it. If those riflemen were still alive right now and had waited for these two flamer spots and two engineer spots to come, this entire engagement is different, right? Uh, although it looks like they've got more than enough to push the, uh, the Axis off field here, so this Mord's gonna go down, this, this Flash is gonna go down. So this Mard, uh, this Panther here could be an issue here. These ATGs stay up. All these two strikes could probably kill us, but three ATG pretty fast, and I don't think they have scouting on this Panther right now. But he's got two Flamers and two, two, uh, Assault Engineers. If these guys go reinforce off the triage, that's probably a good idea right now. You see two more Upgun Hotchkins coming in for myself. Which probably aren't going to do too much, although if they can kill these ATGs off, that'd probably be good for this Panther. Because this Panther could possibly uh, win the game right now, right? <laughs> Panther forces the ATG to retreat, and this ATG here is kind of missing. And you here you get to really see the power of uh, these mobile repairs. Even though this it can't shoot back, it can still push infantry around and really make life difficult for these infantry uh, squads trying to shoot off of these KHH, for example. Sasha does nothing with KCH, this Vet3 ATG, I mean this ATG is just put down here and the ATG here goes down as well. And uh, I'm asking Darson to keep spamming infantry because I feel like that's what we're going to get to. Although Aerie calls the GG. Aerie does call the GG here and looks like uh, the game's going to be called over to here. We can see this repairing uh, Hotchkiss just pushing infantry around, making sure there's not extra rap part coming on this KCH, allowing them to get more kills. And it looks like it's going to be game here, although Volskner still has a lot of infantry still coming on. He's got another Vet2 bar squad, another Marine squad coming on. Um, so there's clearly a really infantry heavy strat going on here. But again, it looks like the Axis have broken areas morale at the, at the very least. Some bickering happening between the two allied players. Uh, but Darson looks like he's got enough Grandeur squads coming on field to really hold off. And I've got Martyrs myself coming on just in case there's some kind of Sherman push possibly coming in from the uh, allies. Although it looks unlikely at this point with the Ariham called the GG. There's a 57 mil coming on from uh, Vols. Uh, the combination of these Grens and these Hotchkiss and Martyrs, uh, it's probably too much for that ATG to deal with alone. And again, these Hotchkiss are pushing the infantry around, kind of uh, make, reduce the amount of firepower they put out. And these KCH are probably going to win the game at this point, regardless of what gets bought out from allies. So it's a good game. It looks like it's game over here. And uh, you got to see uh, what pretty decent matchup back and forth. Um, high vet infantry squads facing off against probably basic uh, uh, squads for the most part from the Axis. Uh, close game in the end, but it does go down as an axis victory in the end. So it was an interesting game to watch. And we're winding down here, it doesn't look like Wolves is going to call anything else on. Uh, and after this game, I can uh, show you uh, the company composition, company build, and also I have uh, the after screen uh, battle report um, to be shown as well. And it does look like I'm pretty sure both axis players are all on at this point. Uh, which shows how high the attrition in this game has been so far. And uh, I think the reason the attrition game ended up working though is the accident, everything they could to really focus down those US infantry uh, squads and, and groups from Volskinator. Uh, because it, it, if, if those squads stay on field right now, uh, these brands are probably fighting off you know three or four Vet 5 squads right now. If we take a look at what uh, like myself, I've got two Martyrs, two Hotchkisses, and that's all I have left. So there's no capping power left for me. Uh, Darson himself, uh, he's at 35 pops, so he's actually got a lot of infantry on field. He's got a League, Panther, KCH, and two Grand Squad. So actually, 
darts in mind actually have a decent amount left actually, so that's a different story. But at the very least, you know that I'm I'm out. I have no infinity power power left. Uh, and so basically, if if those using two squads had been left alive, uh, they would have been playing against really just one player, right? In terms of anti injury capable, because martyrs and hot kiss up and running, they can leave injury too well. Right? They're gonna be left in relegated to a pushing role basically. Uh, which means those vetted infantry squads would still be around fighting off uh, vet one KCH, but then it's just vanilla grenadiers after that, which they can easily do. Um, so that's probably that's probably where the game was lost for the allies here. Is is one though those vetted infantry squads kind of went off alone. A lot of times when you saw those squads get wiped or pushed off the field, it's because they had no support with them. And I think there's just a bit of miscommunication between the allied players of how they want to play this. Uh, Area had a really good Composition for stopping both the Axis players, right? Um, other than the leagues, but Volsk was able to deal with the leagues. Not even Area was able to deal with the leagues due to this howitzer on the field. So Area clearly wanted to play a kind of slower game, kind of creeping up the field along this left side here, uh, using his MG creep to really push the allies back, uh, especially a PE player. Although my PE company isn't really um, that prone to getting ATG creep due to how infantry heavy it is. But a lot of times you saw when Volsk and I went to the town here, it was often here without even a single unit of areas being here to support his infantry pushes. So that probably was miscommunication this their part. And any time these the, the Volscanator vet vet groups were seen, uh, they were focused down on and they were removed from the field. And that really I mean how much how much manpower does Volscanator have left at the end of the game? It doesn't say, I can't say, it didn't show. Uh, but from what I saw he only reinforced maybe an engineer squad and a couple of marine squads and a rifle squad. Uh, so he didn't really get to really show off a good, pull off the reinforcement shenanigans that can be pulled off. So that's the game. It was a good game, I thought. It, 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 there was pressure from both sides. You could see the, what both teams were trying to do. It was like pretty close in the end, judging by, by how much. Uh, Volsk actually had a lot left. It's just that area didn't have anything left to go with Volsk. And again, that major engagement at the end, uh, sending... There were so many piecemeal engagement at the end that allies, if they had just stayed at spawn for an extra 30 seconds, regrouped everything, and then made the push together, this game might very well be going the other way um, at the end here, but it, it was just a bit of poor teamwork at the end by the by the allies that really lost them in the game. I feel like it's not a compositional issue, and I think myself and Darson were able to make pushes together a bit more efficiently. And that's especially at the end with that major push with the the assault the the, the false makers and, and and Panther uh, with Hodgkisses. Uh, that that really that really was the nail in the coffin at the end. Because the allies didn't regroup at that point, they just kept fighting in, and, and that ended the game. But it was a good game, and it's a game I enjoyed playing. I hope it's a game that you enjoyed watching, even though I probably went on some tangents about things like uh, dealing with U.S. infantry or or killing uh, killing off map officers. But I hope it's a game you enjoyed watching and, and seeing it play out. And let's go into the companies and the and the after battle screens. Okay, so here's the after battle screen from the game itself. You can see both teams really guard through now. Dawson, actually, it seems like Dawson probably had a lot left. He only took 59 losses. Although he did have quite a few KCH squads, so I don't actually know what the situation is for Darson. Uh, whether 59 losses is a lot for him or it's a little for him. I would, normally it's a little, but considering how many KCH squads he was running, along with a couple leagues, he might actually not have had too much left. I don't know. You'd have to ask Darson. But I know I was out 94.3 losses. I was off the field. Uh, Volskin had 143 losses. He probably could have taken more if he could get his reinforcement center coming off, but it doesn't really work out. And Aaron himself, 99 losses, so he was probably pretty pretty much all out. So that's the after uh, screen ending. And now I can have let you take a look at uh, the actual uh, company. Uh, this is the loadout here. You can see from the loadout here, it's it's a very aggressive company build. Uh, Fortress Europe, not here. Monte Casino. Uh, Crete Vets, all these are not really in play right now. Mobile Suppression again, not here. Uh, we don't really care about sitting and suppressing and hear hearing targets. Uh, we have Flash Make Operations, which is uh, faster sprint cooldowns, faster medkit usage. I don't actually have it on too many squads because I'm not, I'm not trying to use Flash Make as my main pushing force here. Again, Scout Training, um, it's here. I don't think I actually put it on anything I own, actually. I don't think I'm using Scout Training. I'm just taking it. Ideally, I would prefer to, you know, have quick response, right? 20% speed and hot kisses and, and faster martyr lockdowns. Uh, but I don't have it because of the way the, the, the doctrine trick works out, right? Even if I get rid of follow ops and scout training, uh, I'd only have two points and you need three points to get quick response. Uh, so hopefully in the future that can get fixed. Uh, I know Volkner has been trying to get ERMR to fix these point systems because they're really hurting uh, some company building freedom right now. 
um, because like I would I really like I have flash meter operations I have scout training but I don't really want to use them I'm just using them because I can't really get anything else I don't really want familiar ground I don't want fort syrup because that's a defensive doctrine this is also familiar ground also a pretty defensive doctrine uh, so and that's not the play style it's going for you anyway that camp works out four pop always nice to have extra pop to to be able to get a little bit extra string power anytime uh, we have mechanized advance which is basically Perceived accuracy from vehicles. This is basically just to make the Hodgkins and IHTs a bit more effective, right? Turn some cooldown, not that great, but it's nice to have. Not getting to the rifle squads from your IHTs is always nice. And having received accuracy bonuses on your Hodgkins actually doesn't matter. You saw in that last game a couple of shots got missed by the ATGs. And, you know, I don't know if it's because the 15% perceived accuracy, it might not be, and that might, might be. But having that percentile help always helps, right? But having 69, which is 10% moving accuracy, and this is on all of my assault grins. All of my assault guns of Highway 69, they always want to be running at the opponent and they want to be doing maximum damage while running at the opponent and getting into close range. And of course, mobile mechanics, which is one of the most absurd, aggressive uh, upgrades you can get in all of the AR. It, it honestly is probably, it, it is overpowered. Not probably, it is overpowered. Uh, you can get 300 HP of repairs on your light vehicles, which you can spread into 100 HP increments. It just gives absurd amounts of sustainability to your light vehicles while also making them really, really absurdly pop efficient due to not having to use the repair squads uh, to, uh, to repair them. Even even beyond pop efficiency, it's that they, they, they're, they're so much more survivable too because you can repair as you're going away. One of the things that really kills LV rushes is that you had to get into sticky range or maybe even hit a mine. And having mobile mechanics means you can, you can repair the engine damage while still getting away from the enemy, which gives a lot of survivability to them. Uh, we have expert skirmishers purely for the medkits. The medkits are nice to have. They give a little bit of sustainability when possible, and they help the team too. Uh, field support. Add a, field support is there purely for the one MG42 in the company. Uh, it's just there. The MG42 is there. 42. The MG34 is there just to basically protect the sniper. Help protect the sniper. This entire we have one entire unlock just to support a sniper. That's the only reason it's here. Advanced explosives for the Shreks. Um, that's it. But the Shreks are nice to have. Also having two nades, although my nades isn't there, I do have nades on uh, some of the Flashmaker squad, mainly the Shrek squads. And of course, Flashmakers themselves are being unlocked. Um, to get the company, you can see the opening start here is an LATHT. Uh, two of them, one with Tread Break, uh, two Flashmaker Shrek squads uh, with grenades, and a Flashmaker sniper, and a, a uh, MG34. Although thinking about it, I probably want to, I would probably want to separate these out and do this instead. This seems like a better a better combination uh, to put it in because sometimes I might not want these elite THTs. Uh, then you see we have the assault grins with Highway 69. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine squads of these. And so that's all the pushing power here. I'm wondering if I actually want two squads in this one H IHT, but I don't have two for another HT, so that's how it's going to be. Uh, then we have uh, two columns of Shreks with nades and medkits, plus a nade and a wallops falchion meter. And again here, same thing here. So just it's to get a couple more medkit columns in for the field in case they get stolen or they get used up by teammates or used up by myself. It's pretty rare, but it's always good to have that option. And 50 munitions, uh, it hurts a bit. Uh, you know, that's two grenades you lose that on to, or, or, or possibly, you know, a repair on an IHT you lose that on. Although, actually, considering that, I don't think I have repairs on these IHTs. Uh, so, and I don't really use these grenades on my falchion makers too often. So I might want to, if I were to drop these four grenades, I could actually uh, get repairs, mobile mechanics on my IHTs. That's probably worth it. Let me, you can see this elephant here. This is actually a, a, a community dev account, which is meant for hunt matches, although no one really works manure. It's down here, you can see uh, three martyrs and four Hotchkisses. These are the two Hotchkisses from the game I played. And three kittens down here. And you can see I don't even bother with the scout training uh, on these. Uh, on these kittens, so you can see I have these flash meter operations and, and scout training. I don't really use them too much uh, because my main pushing is with these uh, assault grenadiers mostly. So uh, that's the company, and you can see the idea behind the company is just you know you've got nine assault grenadier squads and you've got a bunch of Hotchkiss upguns. The idea is basically to just run at the opponent, and try and establish some kind of field control, getting units off the field, right? And then once that field control is kind of established. Uh, from that early aggressive pushes from the IHTs, the assault grins, the up and hot kisses. The idea is in the late game you try to transition into uh, uh, the Falschmagers and Martyr combo 
uh, in the late game. So you've got the early game sniper play. You keep that running as long as you possibly can. Once the sniper play starts to kind of break apart, or some, once you get pop or to support the sniper with different things, it transitions into a assault grenadier plus Hotchkiss upgun game. Then once the assault grenadier plus Hotchkiss upgun game has kind of lost its momentum, you switch into a vanilla Falschenegger. Uh, plus Martyr gameplay, which is a bit more static, but the assumption is by the time you've gained guild control in the early game from the high risk 9 Assault Grins and Hodge Kisses, uh, you, you can then have the opportunity to kind of settle down a bit with your Falsh Makers and your Martyrs and trying to hold those grounds that you've gained. And that's basically the entire way this company works. And I don't know if that's really how it got executed. This, that was my first play game, time playing with this company. Probably not last time as well. This is, a, this is a side account. I don't really play this account too often. But that was basically how the game was meant to be played. And the reason I really want to show this off is that people often look at the Falsh Maker company and say, oh, this company is all about Falsh Makers with FG42. Or this company is all about Luftwaffe with LMG34. So you just sit in your bush and you wait for the point to come to you. And, and you just sit and you wait and you, and you farm kills and then you lose games. That's the thing. You sit, you wait, you farm your kills, you get your nice KDR, you get your nice hit, but you lose games. And I think I, I like this company and I really want to show it off because I want to show people Luftwaffe doesn't have to sit in bushes all day. You can play it aggressively and it's, it's got options, right? Highway 69 is a fantastic aggressive option, right? Mobile mechanics can be an aggressive option. Mobile mechanics could fucking be everywhere, to be honest. You can play defensively mobile mechanics, you can play offensively mobile, mobile mechanics. Mobile mechanics is just an OP doctrine. There's like no, if you've got like even more, if you even got like two IHTs in your, in your company, it's probably worth taking mobile mechanics. It's, I see no reason why you wouldn't take it in its current state. Mechanized advance again, receive accuracy bonuses, reduce small arm damage for your vehicles. If you can, if you can find a way to fit quick response in the company, you can do that too. Camp group south, again, it, some people don't like the public bench, some people do like the public bench, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? The thing is, I'm getting at is, you don't have to just spam FG42 falls or, or, or LMG uh, Luftwaffe to, to win games as Flash Makers, to play Flash Makers, right? You can play with you can play with Soul Fans, you can play with Hodge Kisses, you can play with IHTs, you can play with Cypress, you can you can do a lot of things with Falls that I feel like people, Falls or lift off in general, like people don't really see or don't really notice, right? It's not just Warble Wins and Falls. There's more to the company than Warble Wins, Falls, and Luftwaffe. There's more to this company. Uh, it might not be as good as those those builds, I agree. But you have to be aware, of these, these builds are still, then they're still viable in games, right? They're still viable, so it's always nice to see people use different company builds. Anyway, uh, that's that's this cast. Uh, honestly, I, I probably pontificated a bit too much this cast, but you know, I, I, it felt like showing off and it was a fun game, I thought, and I, I hope you enjoyed it.